average in some places, causing pavement to buckle, streetcar cables to melt, and at least 193 deaths across the region. One of our witnesses, Dr. Vivek Shandas, went out and measured temperatures during the heat dome. He found that in affluent neighborhoods, they reached 99 degrees compared to 120 degrees in the poorest neighborhoods in Portland, where the highest number of deaths occurred. Most of these deaths were homeless, elderly, outdoor workers, and those with underlying health issues. A rapid analysis by a global team of researchers found that the Pacific Northwest heat dome would have been nearly impossible without warming from greenhouse gases. This analysis also showed that two degrees Celsius of warming would likely cause severe heat events like this one to occur every five to 10 years instead of once every 1,000 years. NOAA research also predicts that generational heat waves could become annual events. Extreme heat is one of the clearest signals of global warming, with climate change making heat waves longer, more frequent, and more intense. Extreme heat often occurs alongside drought, wildfires, and other climate-fueled disasters. We're seeing this firsthand in the West, which is currently suffering from a historic drought period and an early and brutal wildfire season. In addition to extreme heat events worsening, average temperatures are also on the rise across the U.S., with some regions warming faster than others. Close to my district in New York City, temperatures have gone up 3.3 degrees Fahrenheit on average since the advent of satellite observations in the 1960s. The number of days per year in New York City with a heat index of 90 degrees is predicted to increase from 16 to 51 by mid-century with no action to combat greenhouse gas emissions, according to a report by the Union of Concerned Scientists. Climate change is causing nights to warm even faster than days across most of the U.S. This is particularly alar alarming for human health risks, as cooler nighttime conditions usually provide relief from a hot day, especially for those without air conditioning. We need to also consider that cities are even more susceptible to extreme heat and hot nights than rural areas because of the built environment and lack of vegetation. Surfaces like pavement, asphalt, and rooftops absorb and re-emit heat. This creates urban heat islands and causes temperatures to be up to 10 degrees higher than surrounding areas. As extreme heat ramps up in the U.S., so too will heat-related illnesses and deaths. Extreme heat is the deadliest natural disaster, killing more people than floods, tornadoes, and other extreme weather events combined. The CDC officially reports that heat kills more than 600 Americans a year, but other studies point to this being a severe undercount. The number may be as high as 12,000 heat-related deaths in the U.S., with communities of color and low-income communities most at risk. The harmful effects of extreme heat to human health stresses our public health system. It also winds gaps in equity and leads to losses in worker productivity, costing our economy billions. Sectors such as agriculture and utilities are also vulnerable. In 2015, NOAA, alongside the CDC, launched the National Integrated Heat Health Information System, or NIHHIS. NIHIS works to reduce U.S. heat risks by developing science-based products and services and building capacity, communication, and public understanding of extreme heat. NIHIS is also, also collaborates with other federal agencies and with city and state decision makers to co-produce actionable information needed to inform their planning process. Additionally, the National Weather Service has updated heat indices and heat watches, warnings, and advisories. NWS has also devised a prototype heat risk forecast to better communicate heat risk for specific locations and identify the most at-risk groups. The EPA publishes an excessive heat events guidebook. While some progress has been made in recent years, so much more remains to be done on the federal, state, and local levels. I look forward to hearing from our expert witnesses today who are at the leading edge of the extreme heat research and solutions about the major research and coordination gaps that remain and how additional investments and resources can help fill them. The chair will now recognize Ms. Bice for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl. And I also want to recognize uh, full committee Chairwoman Johnson, who's joining us remotely. Thank you for holding today's timely and important hearing. I also want to thank our witnesses for appearing before the subcommittee and sharing their expertise with us this morning. This summer, historic heat waves across the U.S. have been making headlines week after week, and the impacts have been tragic. 
Many outdoor businesses, business operations have been curbed out of concern for operational safety, resulting in significant economic losses. This comes on top of the crippling effects of the COVID-19 pandemic we've already seen. Even more tragic is the number of lives that have been lost in heat-related deaths this summer alone. As a couple of our witnesses will point out, heat-related deaths of Americans outnumber the fatalities connected to all other natural disasters. Although climate change is likely making the occurrence of extreme heat more common, we cannot simply sit back and accept such a fate. With greater innovation and strategic planning from both the public and private sector, the negative effects of heat waves and other extreme weather events can be better mitigated and lives can be saved. One such example of a private entity acting now is Tomorrow.io, whose CEO and co-founder, Shimon Elkabetz, is here as a witness today. While the National Weather Service provides important weather forecasts and warnings, it can be hard for people to interpret what this data means for them as individuals. Tomorrow.io helps alleviate that confusion by communicating weather forecasts in a clear, operationally focused manner. For example, Tomorrow.io can monitor when and where heat will exceed a specific threshold that will make an electric grid susceptible to outages. Utility companies can use this information to make more informed decisions regarding grid operations. The risk of a power outage occurring can also be conveyed to utility customers so that they may prepare backup plans for staying cool. Tomorrow.io is an excellent example of how commercial enterprises can successfully collaborate with the federal government to accelerate technological advances and improve weather forecasts, as well as communication of forecasts. Tomorrow.io uses publicly available data and incorporates it into their own in-house models to provide more localized forecasts. They also do so in this manner that, when utilized by government agencies, can save millions in taxpayer dollars compared to an exclusive federal operation. If encouraging more public-private partnerships like this can save lives and money, then by all means, we should do all we can to increase the participation of the private sector. To close, I want to paint somewhat of a positive light because I believe societal progress is too often overlooked for attention-grabbing headlines. It is important to remember that the rising cost of disasters is closely related to the overall rise in economic development. Extreme events are more costly because we have more infrastructure to damage, not just because of the complex relationship between intensity and climate. In fact, direct economic losses from disasters as a proportion of global GDP have trended down over the last 30 years. And just last week, the Rhodium Group published a report that predicted U.S. emission reductions could reach as much as 30 percent below 2005 levels by 2030, exceeding the Paris Accord goal of the Obama administration. We are on the right track, and it is always my goal to make more progress. But before we take every negative headline as an unavoidable future, we should first understand what we've been doing right, what we need to fix, and how we can take action to ensure our positive trends continue. Thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl. I yield back. Thank you, and we were honored to have the full committee chairwoman, Ms. Johnson, with us today, and the chair now recognizes the chairwoman for an opening statement. Good morning, uh, and let me welcome all of our witnesses and thank you for all of you joining us today. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to this hearing to discuss the very pressing problem of extreme heat in this uh, country. Uh, being from Texas, uh, my constituents and I expect to prepare for high summer temperatures. However, other parts of the country do not have the infrastructure needed to handle extremely high temperatures. Just last month, news reports documented the record-breaking heat dome in the Pacific Northwest in Portland, Maximum daily records were broken every day for three consecutive days. The resulting heat even melted transit power lines and halted public transit. In Washington State, 
extreme temperatures featured fractured roads and sidewalks, regions where daily June temperatures usually only reach about 70 degrees. So temperatures nearing 120 degrees. Beyond the damage to infrastructure, this heat costs lives. According to the state medical examiner, the extreme temperatures since this June killed over 100 people in Oregon alone because attributing fatalities to heat is so difficult. The actual heat-related death toll is likely really much higher. With heat stress often aggravating pre-existing medical conditions, these deaths will be concentrated among our elderly and the very young. Beyond events like, the, like last month's heat draw, dangerous temperatures are a constant concern for many Americans. One year ago, we held a hearing to discuss the intersection of COVID-19, extreme heat, and environmental justice, highlighting the unequal threat from urban heat islands. Historically, Red line neighborhoods are often home to our most vulnerable communities. In these neighborhoods, concrete is more abundant, trees are scarce, and air conditioning is rare. This leads to urban heat islands that can be as much as seven degrees warmer than any other part of the city. The unequal exposure to extreme heat and urban heat islands can cause harm beyond just public health. Extreme heat has always been linked to worse educational outcomes for children. The prevalence of urban heat islands throughout the US is amplifying the heat stress from the uptick and the unreasonable warmth in this country. The Northeast saw some of its warmest June temperatures in almost a decade. Within a span of five months, Texas went from experiencing some of the coldest temperatures on record to bracing for an unusually early heat wave. These temperature extremes have led to energy grid failures, water shortages, imperiling the lives of millions. We're seeing the climate crisis happen right before us. When addressing crisis of extreme heat, our federal science agencies have a critical role to play. I look forward to the discussion with today's esteemed panel on how we can better coordinate federal resources to address the worsening extreme heat in the country. I thank you and yield back. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Vivek Shandas. Dr. Shandas is a professor in the Toulon School of Urban Studies and Planning. He is also the founder and director of the Sustaining Urban Places Research Lab at Portland State University. He's an interdisciplinary scholar whose expertise is in climate change, urban heat and health, environmental justice, air quality management, green infrastructure, and spatial mapping. Dr. Shandis, Dr. Shandis's focus on climate equity involves direct engagement with historically marginalized communities in describing local stressors and effective approaches to improving accessibility to decision-making systems. Next is Dr. Melissa Guadaro, Dr. Guadaro is an assistant research professor in the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability and Innovation at Arizona State University and works for the Healthy Urban Environments Initiative and Knowledge Exchange for Resilience. Her research focuses on adaptation, equity, vulnerability, urban policy, and governance for the mitigation and adaptation to extreme heat and urban heat island effects. She's currently working to create neighborhood heat solutions that improve thermal comfort and public health outcomes with the cities of Phoenix, Tempe, and Mesa, as well as the Nat Nature Conservancy. 
Conservancy, the Maricopa County Health Department, and community-based organizations. Our third witness is Mr. Shimon Elkabetz. Mr. Elkabetz is the CEO and co-founder of Tomorrow.io. He served in the Israeli Air Force for 11 years. Multiple near-death weather-related experiences during his service stoked a fascination with the weather. Tomorrow.io was founded as a Boston-based weather intelligence and climate security company to bridge the gap between forecast and decision-making, working with customers including federal agencies, utilities, airlines, on-demand services, and professional sports teams. Our final witness is Dr. Aaron Bernstein. Dr. Bernstein is the interim director of the Center for Climate Health and the Global Environment at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, a pediatrician at Boston Children's Hospital, and an assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Bernstein focuses on the health impacts of the climate crisis on children's health and advancing solutions. As our witnesses should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record of, for the hearing. When you all have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. We will start with Dr. Shandis. Doctor? Thank you. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, it's a real um, honor to be able to uh, testify here in front of you today. Uh, Chairwoman Johnson, Chairwoman Cheryl, um, members of the Subcommittee on the Environment. Um, I've been studying urban heat for the greater part of about 20 years now. And admittedly, it started with a big grant from the National Science Foundation to refine our measurement systems, advance <clears throat> uh, geospatial mapping technologies, and getting myself tenure, frankly, at my first job. Um, in that early work, we relied heavily on satellite-derived descriptions about how heat varied across the continental U.S., maintaining a rather technical approach to the field. Over the past decade, however, we've relied um, more and more on hyper-local descriptions of what's happening in and around our urban areas. And as, if you, and as you've identified, these urban heat islands have been directly attributable to differences in temperature, many of which we've seen in larger parts of the, um, the country. And this has been really underscored by the number of deaths that have been happening due to heat waves. And um, the big part of which I'm turning my attention now to engaging community-based organizations in this work. As you likely uh, have already heard, heat waves kill more people than any other natural disaster. And yet FEMA still doesn't recognize it as a natural hazard. A lesser known fact is that it is a discriminating killer. We published work last year and continue to build on this work that shows that historically, that historical segregation policies such as redlining, racial covenants and, and uh, exclusionary zoning that were promulgated in the 1930s have enduring effects that to this day isolate communities of color, immigrants, and lower income folks into areas of cities that are upwards that we've measured of 20 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than other parts of the city at the same time of day. Just this month, we learned as we were just, dis as we were just hearing that human caused climate change was directly implicated in the heat dome event in the Pacific, North in the Pacific Northwest where during that event, I measured temperatures that were 25 degrees warmer than other parts of the city. I've seen firsthand that uh, with increasingly hot days, the temperature differential also increases across the region. We can now say that those who died during the heat dome event were arguably the first climate related deaths in Oregon and Washington. Those who died lacked access to financial capital, social networks, and had aging or injured bodies. We knew who was going to die. I wrote a report in 2009 stating as much, and yet local agency had, agencies had little capacity or understanding for taking swift action on this heat wave. These, are, these and most all other heat-related deaths are preventable, as I think you'll hear other uh, testimonies today, though we're not connecting the dots. I'd like to offer you my opinion about the three things that are needed for reducing excess mortality and morbidity from urban heat. First, because we know that people die in their households, we need hyper-local data about where air temperatures vary at, at the scale of the city block. 
we, we've already mapped with unprecedented detail over 30 cities through a community-based civic science heat campaign. And most cities are lacking that evidence to take swift action. I'd like to propose supporting these cost-effective and highly, and highly engaging campaigns so that communities can socialize the concept of heat as a silent killer, collect the lo necessary local data, and then bring and then being able to take immediate action to move forward on infrastructure and social programs. Second, we need to integrate our understanding of heat with social and infrastructure vulnerabilities that urban regions face. U.S. cities generally are not designed for the kind of heat that we're starting to see. As our infrastructure ages, we have an opportunity to upgrade the systems that we depend on and make them more climate resilient, engaging community-based organizations in the process. Finally, one of the most important parts of addressing urban heat is a coordinated response. Currently, most municipalities do not have a single office that coordinates heat action, which then falls upon nobody, making our ability to stave off heat-related mortality more challenging. The emerging evidence from the Pacific Northwest heat wave is a case in point. The same is true at the federal level. While, while both NOAA and EPA have extensive resource for communities to understand urban heat, we still have very limited coordination across federal bureaus. I would encourage you in my last statement to really think about connecting the dots across the federal bureaus so that we can support local municipalities in taking immediate action on this silent killer. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you. And next is Dr. Guadaro. Good morning, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the House Science Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Thank you for inviting me today. My name is Melissa Guadaro, and I'm bringing testimony deeply informed by working in and learning from communities located in the nation's hottest, large metropolitan area, Phoenix, Arizona, where we are on the front lines for extreme heat. First, I wanna break down this concept of extreme heat as two different yet similar issues, the urban heat island effect and climate change. The urban heat island effect is a result of urbanization where the city retains heat during the day and is slowly released at night. There are many urban heat islands within the city with temperatures ranging as much as 13 degrees or more. Strategies for reducing the urban heat island include increasing shading and implementing heat smart urban design principles. Extreme heat is amplified by climate change. Average temperatures have been increasing steadily and summer heat waves are predicted to be longer and hotter. Climate change reduction strategies include greenhouse gas emission reductions and energy efficiency measures such as weatherization programs. It is important to address both the urban heat island effect and climate change together in a systematic manner. The principal concern, however, is how people experience heat as they move through their day. In other words, optimizing people's thermal comfort. Further, extreme heat needs to be addressed in two different timescales. Immediate emergency action, especially during extreme heat events to provide cooling for people, and long-term programs that constrain a warming future. Long-term strategies are meant to build a cooler environment and in intervention points could include infrastructure, buildings, urban forestry, regional collaborations, and city management. As you see, uh, management devoted exclusively to managing extreme heat in the cities of Phoenix and Miami. Extreme heat is not experienced equally within cities. Residents in low-income neighborhoods live in housing that is often energy inefficient with aging cooling systems and are challenged by ener energy insecurity as a greater proportion of their incomes are spent on electricity. Mobile home residents are especially heat vulnerable. A recent study by the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience revealed that in Maricopa County, Arizona, mobile homes comprise 5% of the housing stock, yet accounted for 28% of the heat deaths. Affordable, livable housing is a critical factor for heat health safety. While poor and marginalized groups historically have suffered the most from climate impacts, they are often left out of the climate planning process. The Nature's Cooling System project was implemented in three underserved neighborhoods to develop hyperlocal community heat action plans. This inclusive storytelling-based planning process revealed different needs and wants between communities despite relatively similar socioeconomic profiles. Federal investments are needed to prepare urban communities for extreme heat and to assist in the mitigation and adaptation to a warmer future. 
Similar to the Storm Prediction Center, a NOAA Extreme Heat Center is needed to coordinate national efforts to understand and respond to impacts of extreme heat. Like the National Weather Service Storm Ready Communities, NOAA can support the scaling up of the Healthy Urban Environments funded Heat Ready Cities program. This program is being piloted right now and provides an evaluation tool to holistically manage how cities identify, prepare for, and mitigate track and respond to the dangers of urban heat. There is a great need for coordination across jurisdictions to ensure that a regional, not a competitive city by city approach is undertaken. Regional working groups can be established not only to develop solutions, but to develop critical social infrastructure, a necessary but often overlooked component in building momentum for transformational change. It is difficult to understand the human cost of heat emergencies without additional efforts towards tracking heat deaths. There are differences in how heat deaths are counted within the same period, resulting in the CDC reporting 618 heat deaths nationally, NOAA reporting less than 150, Meanwhile, in Arizona, where a more comprehensive heat health surveillance is an established practice, 520 deaths were reported in 2020. These discrepancies indicate that we are underestimating the scale of suffering due to extreme heat and undercounting the cost to economic development, human health, and quality of life at a national scale. A research program that provides greater understanding of the economic impact of extreme heat could help to build the business case for extreme heat resilience investments. Coordination between EPA, NOAA, and FEMA to recognize extreme heat as a disaster could provide better prioritization, both of emergency response and long-term mitigation and adaptation efforts. We need to act now to provide more thermal comfort during extreme heat for the most vulnerable populations and to tackle extreme heat in a systemic manner, acknowledging the interconnected nature of extreme heat contributing factors. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Elkabetz. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Sherrill, Ranking Member Bice, Chairwoman Johnson, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. Uh, it is an honor to be here among such distinguished panelists to discuss the rising problem of extreme heat in the US. So my name is Shimon Elkabetz. I was born and raised in Israel and served in the Israeli Air Force for over 11 years, flying Apache helicopters. I've seen firsthand uh, how uh, weather forecasts without context can negatively impact operations in an elite military unit. And in fact, I faced multiple near-death experiences related to the weather. We founded Tomorrow IO as a Boston-based weather intelligence and climate security company because we wanted to improve forecasting and also to bridge that gap between forecast and decision-making. We're working with customers ranging from federal agencies, utilities, airlines, supply chain, on-demand services, and professional sports teams. Extreme heat uh, made worse by climate change is a real challenge that is impacting more people more frequently than ever before. Businesses are feeling the impacts too. Rail operators, uh, for example, have to divert trains to avoid buckled trucks. Electric utilities have to meet increased demand to keep the, the lights and air conditioning on. Airlines, agriculture, shipping, and numerous other industries are significantly impacted by the heat. Uh, improved weather forecasts and new tools to support decision making are critical to minimizing the impacts of such events on people, infrastructure, and the economy. At Tomorrow IO, we see three key components to improving forecasts and response to extreme heat and many other weather and environmental hazards. First, I encourage the committee's continued support of critical weather forecasting infrastructure, which means the observations, models, and computing that underpin all weather forecasts. Today's global weather enterprise is a great success story, also due to the bipartisan support of this committee, yet uh, work remains to be done. Second, I encourage the committee's continued support of programs like NOAA's commercial weather data pilot, which has been successful thanks to the leadership of ranking member Lucas and the members of this committee, but also to broaden the scope and to take advantage of expanding commercial capabilities. In our case, Tomorrow IO will be launching a first of its kind global constellation of small satellites equipped with precipitation radar. NOAA has indicated that one of its greatest challenges is the need to improve precipitation forecasts across timescales from weather to climate. Third, I encourage the committee 
to continue to explore new ways the government can tap into private sector innovation. This includes more open-ended solicitations that allow industry to innovate the path to solving grant forecast ch challenges. This also includes enabling government agencies to leverage private sector technologies to increase their resilience to extreme weather and climate. To that end, uh, Tomorrow.io has developed a unique platform that forecasts weather in high resolution, but more importantly, then transformed that weather data into actionable decisions for our customers. Sherwin and Cheryl, at this time, I would like to share my screen to show the committee how Tomorrow.io's weather intelligence platform helps users adjust their operations to deal with extreme heat and other weather phenomena. Without objection. Okay. Thank you. I need to be able to share, but... There are some technical difficulties. I will try again. Unfortunately, we have technical difficulties, so we'll continue. Um, the Tomorrow IO weather intelligence platform displays high resolution global weather data and provides weather forecasts for all weather parameter, not just heat. And while we're continually improving the accuracy of our forecasts via innovative data sets and advanced modeling technology, what we learned is that focusing exclusively on accuracy and raw weather data is just not enough. Since most individuals, businesses, or governmental agencies have trouble understanding weather data and what it means. That's why we developed the concept of weather intelligence. So from our extensive experience helping customers, We've translated their use cases into actionable business insights and best practices. Uh, we can help a trucking company on a route from New Jersey to Oklahoma by telling them uh, when to delay or avoid portion of the route uh, to avoid food from spoiling due to excessive heat. We can help um, a city like Dallas with precautionary measures specific to each city district and even to a street to ensure worker safety during extreme temperature event. So this is just a small example of how our capabilities today um, work, this will become even more powerful as our satellite constellation comes online. In conclusion, I want to thank this committee for uh, the time and commend you for your leadership in addressing this important issue. Thank you again, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Bernstein. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, for your remarks and Ranking Member Bice for yours and for the opportunity to testify before all the members of the subcommittee today. Um, I'd like to start my testimony with uh, an anecdote that occurred during the hottest stretch of the hottest June in Boston's history uh, just this year. Uh, a mom approached me with a question, a totally reasonable question, which was, was it safe for her child to play outside? Now that's a question that I imagine many of you who are parents had probably not thought twice about unless perhaps your children grow up in very hard, hot parts of the country. But I'll tell you from my experience, this is a question that most parents certainly in the Northern part of the country have never really had to take seriously. I know full well what heat can do to a child's body. Uh, it can shut down any organ. Uh, children with asthma will have a harder time breathing. Children with kidney disease may have their kidneys fail. Even children, adolescents in particular, who are depressed may in fact take their lives because of the heat, and there's evidence that suggests that heat may be stunting the growth of fetal development. But none of that actually enabled me to help this mother protect her child. At this late date, when we can already plainly see how human-caused climate change is influencing the severity of heat in our country, we simply do not have the knowledge we need to protect our most vulnerable citizens. Answers to questions like this mother's are urgent for a number of reasons, many of which my fellow uh, panelists, uh, as well as in the introductory remarks, have made clear. We know heat is lethal, and we know that heat waves are going to get more prevalent and severe uh, in coming decades. Uh, he can harm us in surprising ways. We focus on mortality, which is a very worthy endpoint, but it's critical to recognize that heat has been associated with everything from life-threatening bacterial bloodstream infections, infant mortality, injuries not just in outdoor workers, but in indoor workers, harm to our soldiers, uh, and a variety of other ailments. Uh, the pace of warming is fast enough now that we can see additional harms occurring within a generation. 
warming across the United States is happening such that in a place like Cleveland, uh, where it has been above 90, maybe it'll be above 90, that is a heat index, maybe a half dozen times. Uh, this year, by 2050, it's expected to be 20 or more without rapid action to decarbonize. In places like Houston, uh, there are 10 days with the heat index over 100 today. By 2050, again, without robust action on climate, there may be 60. The second cause for urgency is that while we have seen a tremendous improvement in heat-related mortality around the country, uh, over the past few decades, there's evidence that mortality trends are reversing, particularly in southern and southeastern states. Chairwoman Woman Johnson's comments about Texas and people being prepared are absolutely true. We see a gross differential across the southern to northern states, but we also see alarming trends that in some of the hottest parts of our country, mortality rates are going up, and especially in certain populations that are not typically thought to be at risk, like men between the ages of 45 and 64. Another knock-on effect of heat that needs to be watched carefully is the effect on electricity prices in Portland and other parts of the Northwest. Prices went up by fourfold. Uh, that is essentially a regressive tax on the poor from heat events. We know that people who have air conditioning may not turn it on when it gets hot out and price spikes in electricity can increase that. We've heard a great deal about the disproportionate effects of heat uh, on certain populations in the country. Uh, we know that people of color, particularly black Americans, are exposed on average to two degrees Celsius uh, of temperature, more heat than others, and that rates of mortality among people of color are manifold greater than others, with black Americans being three times more likely to die from heat, and, and particularly indigenous peoples in this country, six times more at risk. So we have a tremendous amount of stake for health, equity, uh, and importantly, our economy. Uh, and we can do much more. And to start with, I would love to be able to tell the families I care for what temperatures warrant caution for their children's health. We can do that with support through NIH and support for NOAA, uh, who can provide more localized, as we've heard, uh, predictions around heat. Uh, we have to leverage the healthcare sector. Uh, we can use the resources in Medicare and Medicaid to incentivize providers who know the conditions that put people at risk for heat, have direct lines of communication to them, we can mobilize those resources to make sure that we get to our most vulnerable citizens. And finally, I have to underscore that when we look in the solution space, we're very quick to ask how much implementation will cost, but we rarely take full accounting of the benefits of our actions. And urban greening is a particularly important example of this. Yes, urban greening can cool down cities, which we've heard are critical but it also can improve air quality. It can reduce runoff that's associated with waterborne diseases. It can even improve mental health and carry a host of other benefits. And so I urge you to consider as you think about the path forward to take a more full accounting of what's at stake for health and equity so that we can provide for the healthiest and most just future possible. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. At this point, we'll begin our first round of questions and I'll recognize myself for five minutes. The record-shattering heat dome in the Pacific Northwest revealed vulnerabilities in local infrastructure with pavement buckling and cables melting. In my district in New Jersey and neighboring districts, heat waves are usually accompanied by power outages. With extreme heat worsening across the U.S., I'm worried that Northeast infrastructure will suffer additional consequences. Dr. Shandis, how well do we understand infrastructure vulnerabilities in urban centers, and what kind of evidence base do we need to build to inform climate resilient infrastructure decisions? Thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl. Um, infrastructure in our cities, as we well know, is designed with a specific range of climate in mind. Infrastructures made and the HVAC systems that are in buildings are made with this um, essentially a boundary condition that allows um, buildings to operate in specific ways, roads, rail lines, et cetera. And when those boundary conditions are extended, that's where we start seeing uh, cascading effects of infrastructure failure, like uh, the heat dome and the examples that were just brought up. And so often what we've done in our cities is build around those conditions. And when we are seeing these uh, aberrations to that specific 
uh, set of conditions, we are going to be seeing more and intense uh, shifts that happen. In the Pacific Northwest, I can say that many of us were holding on to uh, kind of holding on uh, to ourselves thinking what else is about to break as because we all knew that the buildings, roads, cables, et cetera, were not designed with that particular uh, level of heat in mind. And so our, generally speaking, our infrastructure is woefully inadequate to be able to manage um, the level of heat that we're seeing. And the concern that I have is the multiplicity of uh, factors that are at play here. Heat is one thing, but then when, as some other panelists have identified, coupled with other um, serious climate-induced threats like wildfire, uh, a family will have to ask, do I open the windows at night, let the polluted air in as I sleep, and that cool, cooler polluted air as I sleep or close those windows and just really bake in my own home. Those are real big trade-offs. Those are real trade-offs within the infrastructure system that we have right now in many of our cities. And so the evidence base that we really need to be thinking about here is to think is to get down to the place where individual households, businesses, uh, municipal planners, public health agencies can identify specific places where it might be very um, it might be very hazardous to be able to actually um, um, go during specific times of the day. We don't have that kind of granularity of information where if a, a, a parent is walking their child to school on a hot day, do they take road X or road Y, road Y being 10, 15 degrees cooler for that asthmatic child who might run into some serious um, health related impacts taking road X versus road Y. So that level of granularity is an evidence base that we really need to get to and groups like tomorrow.io, groups like ours that have been trying to um, narrowly define and get to a point where we can see that level of difference um, will really advance our ability to make informed decisions about where the interventions will be most effective for the communities that are hardest hit. Thank so you. Will, um, oh, I'm sorry. I have limited time, ahead. so I just want to get to one more question. Yep. Uh, Dr. Guadaro, in addition to making built materials like rooftops and pavement more heat resilient, how can green spaces or other natural solutions help lower temperatures in urban areas? Green infrastructure can certainly help lower temperatures in areas, and um, you can have something like an increase in your tree canopy and planting the right tree in the right place where people are to make this a people-centered approach would be effective in not only lowering temperatures, but also increasing people's thermal comfort. And then there are added benefits too, that um, it cleans the air, green infrastructure helps with stormwater management, but we also must take into account a systems view of this. Green infrastructure needs to be balanced with water usage, and we need to make sure that we are using these planting principles in places where people are as they move through their day. There's been an interesting study by a colleague of mine that it said regardless of whether or not the infrastructure lowers temperature, if people see a tree or green infrastructure, they actually feel cooler. So that's an area that we really could use a lot more research into. Moving, taking the information that we have about the air temperature and surface temperature and turning that into how that impacts people's perception and their, their mm -hmm. feeling of thermal comfort. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, my time has run out. So um, I am going to now recognize the uh, ranking member of our subcommittee, Ms. Vice, for five minutes. Thank you. In my state of Oklahoma, I know a thing or two about extreme weather. In May of 1999, the strongest tornado ever recorded developed in Moore, Oklahoma. That said, technology has been developed as an early warning system for tornadoes that have saved thousands of lives across the country. Mr. Elkobetz, can you help us understand exactly what kind of data and weather patterns you look for when examining extreme heat predictions? And does the federal government, whether it's NOAA, NASA, or one of the service branches, have the tools to provide such data? Thank you. So from a technology and scientific perspective, actually forecasting uh, extreme heat is um, less challenging. It is something that the agencies and the community are doing quite well. Uh, we do not necessarily differentiate from a forecasting perspective between forecasting heat or forecasting any other weather phenomena. In that context, I do think that we need to think about the problem in two dimensions. 
the long term and the short term. In the long term, yes, we need uh, definitely uh, to make sure our infrastructure can sustain climate change, and we need to improve the infrastructure to sense weather so we can predict it better. Uh, that's why tomorrow IO is launching uh, its satellites to cover the world with radars. But what I want to highlight is that what we're focusing on in the context of extreme heat and other phenomena is the intelligence element, the insights. We are already in the era of consequences, and that takes us to the short term. In the short term, we can do a lot to prevent damages and casualties um, by putting in place systems that translates the extreme heat into uh, uh, actionable insights. Any city, any education institution from schools to universities can have automation in place that tells exactly on a, on a weekly calendar, on a daily, hourly uh, calendar, what to do and what precautionary, precautionary measures to take in order to avoid the damages because the knowledge as Mr. Bernstein uh, and uh, as indicated is there. We already know the connection between uh, the weather and the impact. Now we need to put the systems in place so we can be proactive. And this is what we're looking for in terms of the patterns. Thank you. Um, Mr. Shandis, you talked a little earlier uh, about the um, monitoring of temperatures in urban areas. Can you talk, speak to how you would anticipate being able to do that on a block by block basis? Although that could be helpful, I think scalable would be the question that I would have for you. Thank you for the question. Um, there are really two different ways uh, and complementary ways to do um, block by block measurements as we've done. One is something that we've used for a very long time and that's satellite based approaches. We have satellites already flying around the planet that describe at relatively um, course scales what is happening at a specific, within a city block. We can get 30 meter resolution, for example, from satellite imagery to describe what the uh, surface temperature is in specific places. The other is to actually monitor air temperature. And that's the campaigns that we've been engaged in, engaged with. And it really has to, it really has two components. One is a community-based uh, data collection process where we engage with environmental, um, uh, and social justice organizations within cities who um, might not have a direct interest or direct relevance to heat. And we work with the communities and the municipality to be able to go out and collect hundreds of thousands of uh, measurements in one specific hot a heat day uh, in a place. And that really socializes the concept and yet gives us, and also gives us very granular data, data that we haven't been able to see. Uh, uh, it's un unprecedented to this date. And that combined with stationary um, uh, sensors where we can actually drive by and combine the both spatial and temporal variability, we can see when a heat wave's coming, how one neighborhood or one city block is actually going to fare far worse than another particular part of the city. So that Thank combination- you for that. My time is short, so I want to make sure I get uh, one more quick question in. Sure. It's interesting that you mentioned satellites. Um, Mr. Alkabetz is actually talking about that in his uh, in, within his company. Um, to you, Mr. Alkabetz, can you talk a little bit about how renewable energy companies can use weather data like Tomorrow.io offers to optimize operations and how this can protect uh, lives and property during weather events. Definitely, uh, the most uh, uh, the biggest challenge they have is actually predicting the output, what they can generate on any given day, and that is directly correlated um, to the weather. So by having more accurate weather forecast down to the facility, uh, they can better forecast that and 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 serve the customers. So when you think about extreme heat, if the supplier finds itself without enough capacity to support a grid, it can be a big challenge. We're supporting by providing more uh, granular, finely tuned weather forecast for the needs of that renewable company. Uh, but moreover, we're providing them historical data so they can train their models and understand the relationship between the historical weather data and the historical production, and then use regularly using machine learning the forecast of the weather to understand the forecast of the generation. Thank this you, and I'm afraid the gentlewoman's time has expired, so I'm now going to recognize the chairwoman of the full committee, Ms. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start with Dr. Shandas. Uh, Dr. Shandas, can you discuss how climate change will impact extreme heat events 
in the U.S. moving forward. Uh, because it seems to me that though we have looked at certain areas of the country, that it's getting to be more commonplace around the country. Um, some of the extreme heat has been affected parts of the country where, such as Arizona, um, Northwest recently, Texas. Can you elaborate on how heat prone parts of America already responding to heat stress? And are these lessons that we learn uh, can be used uh, from one city to another and municipalities uh, through some way that the federal government can spread this information, especially through these communities, because I believe that we're about to embark upon a deadly summer. And I realize that some areas of the country have not been uh, as accustomed to this heat, but I, I think this heat could show up anywhere, frankly, with the global change that we're experiencing. Thank you, Congresswoman Johnson. Um, the relationship between climate change and heat is um, really getting far, uh, getting more and more resolved. And what we're seeing is that this heat dome that we experience in the Pacific Northwest not only broke records, but broke climate models. The climate models are relatively conservative in being able to look at the probabilities between what a greenhouse gas Earth, uh, greenhouse gas uh, emitted earth looks like versus one that's not. And that difference of probability has now become unequivocally clear about the role that climate change and greenhouse gases have played in the heat dome that we just experienced. And also for those other heat waves that we're likely to see coming this, this summer. Um, in terms of the core, in terms of the relationship between some parts of the country having had a lot more experience and others, I would really look to uh, Dr. Guadaro um, for the work that's been going on in Arizona and other parts uh, that are really hot, though I will just quickly note that one of the challenges that we've noticed in doing this work nationally of um, looking at uh, high resolution temperature is is that regional coordination is very challenging right now. Individual municipalities are working largely on their own, often based on their own goodwill and um, to be able to get ahead of this. And right now, they really don't see a lot of support coming from the federal government to be able to create a regional entity that could help different municipalities in a particular bioclimatic zone of the country get ahead of this, uh, get ahead of these heat waves that are coming. And so part of what I would really um, underscore and emphasize is a need for creating na um, regional networks of municipal uh, heat planners that could learn from each other and share those lessons um, to across the country. Uh, Dr. Guadaro, did you wanna uh, contribute to that question as well? Yes, thank you, Dr. Shondas. Uh, certainly it's very hot in Arizona and um, we have been dealing with this for quite a, a long time. And the weather that we experience in Arizona is certainly going to be the normal for other regions in the country. So I think there are some really great lessons to be learned by how we approach heat. So first of all, our buildings are really built with the idea that this is a hot climate. All housing is built with central air conditioning. When we build parks, we understand that we have to provide thermal comfort for people. And that doesn't just mean trees as shade, it also means other structures as well. Uh, when we look to um, have public transit, we make sure that our public transit is shaded or that we're going to get shading in big public transit nodes. So the infrastructure is already to some extent um, a normal, uh, the way that we approach it is just very normal. So you, when you build playgrounds, you would have a covering over it to shield the children from extreme heat. So um, my, my advice would be that other, other municipalities learn from what we've done in the region to address it. That said, I think that we still have a long way to go in, in Arizona to make sure that we're keeping people safe. And the other uh, area that I think that the federal government could be really helpful is, as Dr. Shandos has said, helping to formulate these regional working groups 
that could help municipalities to not be in a competitive environment. Because if one municipality has an urban forestry program and the other one doesn't and is rapidly paving over their city, they're working at cross purposes. So we have to make sure that we're not allowing for people to shop, if you will, uh, areas within one region that have lesser regulations or lesser political will to go and address increasing urban heat. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank believe... you. Sorry. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. My time is about to expire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and next, the chair recognizes Mr. Jimenez for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no questions at this time. I yield my time back. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Feenstra for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Cheryl and Ranking Member uh, Bice. Thank you to all our witnesses for the testimony and sharing your extensive research on this, um, these experiences and this important subject. The issue of severe weather is important to my district. Farmers are highly attuned to the seasonal weather changes and the weather patterns. The ability to prepare for extreme weather is very important. Uh, Mr. Uh, Alcabetz, just as elsewhere in the country, my district in Iowa has been experiencing persistently higher than average temperatures this summer, as well as moderate severe drought conditions. These conditions require advanced preparation for our farmers and our ranchers. You've described how your weather intelligent platform can monitor and provide operating recommendations for various sectors in your testimony. What sort of capabilities could the platform provide for our agricultural community and specifically the supply chain when it comes to transporting livestock and perishable goods? Thank you. Um, I'm actually coming from family of farmers myself. So this topic is very dear to my heart as well. Um, we're doing two things. One is improving the accuracy of weather forecast in a way um, of uh, basically creating more observations and running our own models on HPC in the cloud. That enables us to fine tune uh, the granularity of the forecast. But as you indicated, the data itself, uh, the raw data itself is not enough. The insights that our platform provides uh, uh, relates to planting, irrigation, fertilizing. For example, let's look at a simple example of um, um, spraying and after three hours you have rain that washes the spray that can be a significant damage so the platform provides a, a weekly calendar with recommendations for the farmer uh, about what to do uh, not necessarily what will be the weather uh, so this is very helpful you can even uh, automate uh, agronomist uh, uh, algorithms into the software and get uh, a specific uh, to species type of recommendations in the context of supply chain as you asked uh, we're working with supply chain and intermodal companies, including railways. Uh, we're helping with route efficiency um, around when is the best time to do uh, a drive uh, and to avoid excess uh, heat uh, and avoid the, the food spoilage and, and, and areas of that kind. Thank you so much for, for that information. This is very critical to agriculture and the supply chain. Um, this is for uh, any one of the experts. Uh, my state is also a leader in wind energy and my district specifically has a large wind energy footprint. In addition to precipitation droughts, uh, heavy or heat waves are also known to cause wind droughts. Uh, they can decrease wind and wind energy output. These type of droughts have affected wind energy in recent years in both the U United States and Europe. With increased extreme heat, do we see these wind droughts increasing in frequency? If anyone could take that question, I'd appreciate it. Anyone? Mr. Feenstra, we can take that question for the record and have our experts um, get you an answer. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Cheryl. Um, 
Finally, uh, just one other question. Uh, much of the testimony today has focused on the impact of high temperatures have on urban populations, given that cities tend to have higher, uh, higher temperatures as compared to the surrounding rural areas. While I agree with the issues of urban heat is significant concern in my district, especially in Sioux City and Ames, Iowa, I also worry about the unique challenges people in rural areas face. For example, rural populations are more spread out, meaning uh, some are socially isolated and have barriers to travel uh, and for communal center uh, cooling. Have any of our witnesses given thought to this and how we could not only promote heat ready cities, heat ready cities, but also heat ready communities in my regions, in my rural areas? Thank you for that question. I think that while we are talking about urban heat, extreme heat is everywhere and it's certainly in the rural areas as well. And again, we need to look at that at two different time scales. So you have an immediate emergency concern. So when there's an extreme heat event or if you have a period where it's extraordinarily hot, you need to provide cooling for people. And one of the ways to do that is to have a robust cooling center network. And there are examples within Arizona, certainly the heat relief network in Arizona is one such case where you could be able to provide cooling. And even though people are spaced out, you can also have a network of people who are helping. So in our case, in the heat relief network, we've had uh, all sorts of community members step up, including having the utility company pay for lift rides to cooling centers. So that's a short-term solution. And long-term solutions are also to provide cooling spaces for people along the way. Um, I see that I'm out of time, but to provide cooling spaces for people and, and handle long-term mitigation and adaptation. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments, and I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Kildee for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Cheryl, for holding this really important hearing. I've been sort of toggling back and forth. I've got lots of things going on today. So if my question is redundant, I apologize for that. Um, over seven years ago in my hometown, uh, a water crisis emerged. My hometown is Flint, Michigan. Uh, children were affected by this crisis, uh, exposed to high levels of lead, which we know poses really significant health risks to kids, particularly in their development. What was not as well known during that water crisis is that there was an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease in Flint uh, as a result of the crisis. Um, Michigan, again, sadly, is experiencing a surge in Legionnaire's disease. This week, in fact, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services announced that Legionnaire's disease cases during the first two weeks of July were up 569% from the same period a year ago. Michigan officials attribute this rise in cases to rain, flooding, and warmer weather, warmer temperatures in particular having an impact. Environmental health and climate experts in Michigan have been warning that climate change causing more extreme weather, more volatile water cycles, uh, allows for an environment for waterborne bacteria like Legionella bacteria to thrive. And so, Dr. Bernstein, I wonder if you could speak to ways in which climate change, particularly extreme heat, can provide a breeding ground for bacteria and waterborne illnesses such as Legionnaire's disease. Sure. Thank you for that question, Representative Kildee. So, um, as you mentioned, extreme weather is associated with waterborne diseases. That's particularly true in places like Representative Feenstra's district in Iowa, uh, in the uh, particularly Mississippi uh, watershed where we see heavy down, so baked earth uh, followed by heavy downpours causing runoff that causes bacteria viruses to get in the water. That's probably the clearest signal that we have in this country of climate change effects on disease. Um, we also see in coastal areas, so in uh, Congress, um, in Jimenez's this district uh, of Miami, uh, the risks of uh, harmful algal blooms, red tides, brown tides is affected by heat uh, most of the heat of climate change is going to the oceans. Those aren't just problems for marine organisms. Um, they're actually direct toxins to people who may be in those waters. And importantly, they aerosolize so that people have breathing problems, breathe those in, get sick. Uh, heat is a major issue uh, for wildfire smoke, we know, but often through a pathway that involves diseases of trees. 
So we see the movement of these pests on trees. Uh, uh, bark beetles in the West, they kill the trees, make them more vulnerable. That air pollution is a major driver of respiratory infections. So this is a pathway of heat uh, leading to deaths. We saw a lot of evidence around uh, the COVID pandemic that people had been breathing polluted air, uh, were more likely to die. That's not just true with COVID, that's true every winter with the flu uh, and other respiratory conditions. Uh, heat, of course, makes it possible for other pests to move, like the ticks that transmit diseases, like Lyme disease. We've certainly seen that uh, in this country already. Uh, and I think critically, and one area I would underscore here, is heat is a major threat to healthcare. Uh, we know that heat is driving power outages, and hospitals and clinics, particularly clinics that are in rural areas and hospitals in rural areas, are not equipped to deal with power outages very well. And that means that people who have infections are more likely to have bad outcomes. And I think we really need to get our heads around uh, what heat means to healthcare uh, through research. I was going to ask that. Do you, have you come up with or can you suggest specific areas of research where we could explore further the linkage between heat and disease outbreaks? Yeah, it's, it's a critical piece. And I actually wanted to pick up on something uh, Representative Feenstra said, you know, to be perfectly blunt, we don't know how to protect rural Americans from the heat. Knowledge, folks, is not going to save us. We can have all, and I'm, I, I'm a big proponent of knowledge here, but we can have all the data we want about heat. But if we don't know how to implement it and whether those strategies work, it ain't very helpful. So we have to get information about what temperatures matter to health, but we need much better understanding of what kinds of interventions matter. So that means we got to get CDC to work with NOAA to implement and assess these things. Uh, we need the healthcare system. We spend $4 trillion on healthcare by our own estimates. A quarter of that is on fully preventable diseases. That means we've got a trillion bucks we're throwing down the drain, folks. Can we please put some of that to invest in protecting our citizens from heat without spending any more money? So there's a huge need to get a handle on this. One last point here is heat's going up and rates of medication use in Americans are going through the roof. And you know what? The evidence we have is that medications may be increasing heat risk. So again, you can know a lot about heat exposures, but a person on a medication may be far more likely to get sick. The health system knows that public health agencies don't. We better understand whether people like me who are prescribing drugs to everybody else are causing a necessary harm in heat events. Thank you. I'm afraid just the gentleman's areas. time has expired. Thank you. And so I next turn to Ms. Okay, <laughs> the chair now recognizes Mr. Gonzalez for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl and Ranking Member Bice for holding this hearing today uh, and to our witnesses for, for joining us. It's clear extreme heat waves can have serious societal, ecological, and, and economic impacts. And with the recent events in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it's, it's essential that we think critically about how we prepare for, for the future and mitigate these risks. Uh, I think we, we're all seeing now fires every year. Uh, it's becoming a routine part of life uh, on the West Coast. Um, and it's something that, that I think we should all be very concerned with. Can't imagine uh, raising a young kid out there right now and, and knowing that you know, you're know you gonna have these wildfires and, and all the smoke risks that, that come with that. Um, Mr. Alcabetz, your company is at the center of, of this new effort to aggregate data, model it, and ultimately relay it to clients in a user-friendly way. Um, have you faced any obstacles in helping clients consume and respond to the information that your company provides them? Thank you. <clears throat> so definitely uh, part of uh, our innovation comes from uh, things that were real challenges as we engage with customers. So at the beginning of our way, uh, we innovated mostly around how to make uh, weather uh, forecast more hyper-local. Very fast, when we engage with customers, we learned that about 90% of the businesses, based on our estimation, are not really equipped to understand raw weather data. Even if I give them the AQI for tomorrow at 2 p.m., the most accurate way, they will not necessarily be able to do that. And that has a few components. The first is, of course, the translation of the weather data to actionable insights. We're working with football clubs and with leagues and such around when to do the practice, when is the best time to do that, what kind of recommendations to give to the audience uh, in the stadium and such. Um, but the more interesting element is how do you automate it? How do you make sure that you truly get the right information in the right time to the relevant audience so they can make decisions? Because even if you have all the knowledge, 
as Dr. Bernstein indicated, there's still this gap between making sure that the right individual gets the decision in the right time. And that's what we're focused on. And we developed that interface uh, in two ways. One for visual, uh, basically a person that looks at the screen and makes those decisions, but also via data feeds. So it can integrate to other systems and other systems can be everything from street lights to sewage systems um, to IoT devices. So they can be proactive to the risks of weather and will make decisions ahead of what's coming. And, and that's how we're solving this problem for our customers and we can solve it for municipalities, government agencies and more. Thank you. And then has your company partnered with any local or state governments? And if so, are there any issues that are limiting their ability to take action on these warnings uh, when they come through? Yeah, uh, an example is the city of Quincy here in, in Boston where they suffer uh, in the um, uh, summer from heat events like we're just talking about in the winter from snow removal challenges um, or, or uh, anything related to resource allocation during storms. They've been finding the, the software pretty useful and we're working also with governmental agencies like the US Air Force and, and others. Um, I don't see regulatory issues around using those insights at the moment. Uh, and I'm glad uh, that it is the case and, and we hope uh, that it will continue in such a way. Thank you. And then one of one gap in our understanding of extreme heat is our lack of ability to predict what the maximum high temperature a region may experience is and how long that high temperature can persist. Uh, what progress has Tomorrow.io made in addressing this issue and how, if at all, can federal agencies help? So scientifically, we uh, do not have evidence that we were able to improve that specific element. However, uh, we are working on technologies around sensing and around modern modeling. Uh, in the modeling, we're working on, uh, together with the uh, uh, other partners, we're basically the architects of the EPIC program. And we're hoping that by putting the models in modern cloud, it will help the community further innovate and maybe find the solutions to improving the modeling. On the Thank data, you, which is really the input for those models, let's look at the, the West Coast, right? This is where we're talking about in terms of the wildfires. The forecast for the West Coast is highly dependent on what's happening in the Pacific two days ago, three days ago, and before that. We know that the oceans are blind to active radars. And as a result, we do not have accurate monitoring of storms, tropical storms from hurricanes to cyclones and typhoons and others over the oceans. Without that, the forecast of any weather parameter is highly limited. So by covering the entire world with active radars, we're going to improve the forecasting skills by a lot, including the problem you just mentioned. Great. Well, uh, I know we all wish you luck in, in that endeavor, and, uh, and I, I appreciate your testimony and uh, yield back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Ms. Bonamici for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chair Cheryl and Ranking Member Vice, and thank you especially to our witnesses for joining us for this very timely hearing. Uh, the unprecedented heat wave in the Pacific Northwest last month was a natural disaster that tragically claimed the lives of 116 Oregonians and many more across the region. My heart goes out to their families and friends. Most heat-related deaths are preventable, and we owe it to their families and friends to take action that will prevent further loss of life. We must recognize that the devastating heat dome disproportionately affected vulnerable communities, like the low-income neighborhoods that became heat islands surrounded by concrete and excessive emissions from highways, seniors who lacked air conditioning and fans to stay cool, not all houses in the Pacific Northwest have air conditioning, and the communities of color who lacked access to green spaces to provide adequate shade uh, because of racist historical redlining policies. State emergency management officials acknowledge that 750 people who called an information line during the heat wave were unable to connect with an operator for assistance because of a staffing shortage. Public transit was suspended because the light rail trains couldn't withstand the extreme temperatures, and that prevented people from getting rides to cooling centers. So Dr. Shandis, I know you've been researching these issues for decades and really raising the alarm about urban heat and its deadly consequences for vulnerable communities. And I sincerely hope that my colleagues on this committee will join me in heeding your urgent call and committing to bold, comprehensive, science-based climate action. 
And I'm grateful for your work. I know you collected local heat data to raise awareness about the disparities for historically marginalized communities. And in a recent report, I saw that you and your son measured an air temperature of 124 degrees in Southeast Portland, I believe in the Lentz neighborhood last month, that was 25 degrees higher than a measurement around the same time in more prosperous neighborhoods. How can this hyper-local data help to inform investments that will improve the resilience of our communities for future extreme heat events? Thank you, Representative Bonamici. It's wonderful to see you. And um, this work has, ha has really about three parallel lines, and I'll try to summarize them really uh, briefly. One is we have many different ways to measure heat. It might seem really obvious in talking about heat, but as we continue to unpack this and think about the satellite approach, think about the ground-based approach, uh, community members as well as municipal planners and uh, state agencies are really grappling with what is the quote best way to measure heat. And so we are deep in this process of trying to reconcile a lot of the different approaches that are currently being used. So that's a scientific foundation upon which decisions can be really promulgated. And second is really to base, uh, um, base these measurements and the interpretation with the communities that are hardest hit with this, uh, with extreme heat. And often communities that are hardest hit are often saying, I've weathered a heat event before, or it gets hot and I just, you know, deal with it. And that's where we start seeing, particularly in areas like the Pacific Northwest, communities just not well prepared, not really socialized with the understanding of the implications of heat. And so places where they can get this information and also be engaged in the interpretation of what's happening locally is, is essential. So really grounding this in the community and civic science approach is something we've been as a second parallel track. And then the the third is to really think about, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, a coordination network within particular <clears throat> regions of the country. For example, the Pacific Northwest, we've been talking to folks from uh, northern Washington state over to Idaho, down to southern parts of Oregon, to really get a handle on what does it mean to be embarking upon the heat uh, mitigation strategies and understanding what's effective in this region, which may be very different than what's effective in the Southwest, in the Southeast, the Northeast, the Midwest, etc. And so we really want to create these regional hubs of uh, heat, um, of, of heat practitioners, heat um, planners, and public health uh, agencies that can really bring all of this um, Kind of Dr. Sean, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I have a few seconds left, and, and yep. you, you led me to my my last question, which is where you you emphasize that coordinated response. What steps could this committee committee and Congress take to improve coordination at the federal level, and what are the current gaps in sharing federal resources with local, state, and tribal governments? How can we close those gaps? Right. I would, uh, there is already a mechanism in place. I would really point us to the National Integrated Heat Health Information System. That group is already bringing together several different agencies, including FEMA, EPA, NOAA, CDC, to really address this coordinated approach. And if uh, we see the federal government really bringing their coordinated uh, attention to this, I think what local municipalities will start to do is also reduce the silos that are currently in place in different bureaus and start to do more coordinated effort, which is really at the core of a lot of um, de developing preventable approaches to, to heat debts. Thank you so much, Dr. Saunders. I see my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and the chair recognizes Mr. Kasten for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, to our, our witnesses. I, I must say, it's a part of this whole hearing that makes me very sad. Um, and, it, and it makes me sad because pre-COVID, I think the three biggest days for single day um, above baseline mortality events in the United States were 9-11 at nearly 3,000 people. Um, Hurricane Katrina at 1800. And the number three was the 1995 Chicago heat wave that killed 700 people. And so much of what Dr. Shondas was talking about, what makes me sad is that this isn't new, right? In, in, in 1995, the people who died were the least among us. The, it was people who couldn't afford air conditioning, people who didn't have social networks checking in on them. Um, since that time, inequality has increased. Since 1991, we've emitted 50% of all the CO2 we have ever emitted as a species since we first learned how to make a fire a million years ago. And 
you know, we're talking a good game, but at some point, future generations are going to watch our feet and ask if we moved. Um, and I'm sorry to be sad and bring us down, but it, I'm sad. Um, but Dr. Shondas, I want to I, I, I want to maybe use that to riff a little bit to you. There's um, University of Chicago, the the Epic Energy Policy Institute has done this really interesting work that I'm sure you're familiar with on the, the social cost of carbon and how these things change regionally. And as you have looked around to see where these inequities exist, where the costs are, there are some of the costs that are functions of, of social policy questions. Where do we plant trees? What do we do for building codes? And we can, we can fix those legislatively. There are some of those costs that are just geographical. Um, there's a reason we don't build cities in Death Valley. There's a reason we don't zone homes on floodplains. And as temperatures rise in areas to Death Valley levels, as flooding gets more common, um, some of these issues are only solved by relocation. As you've looked at your data, you know, following up on what um, Congresswoman Bonamici asked about sort of the hyperlocal questions, have you thought at all about how to quantify to what degree are the solutions we should be thinking about social questions? And to what degree do we need to be, is it more cost effective to think about providing people with opportunities to relocate? Yes. So the, the, the extent to which we've looked at this, relocation has been really brought up a lot around um, sea level rise and managed retreat discussions that are active in the literature. Uh, and um, we have yet to see those um, implemented in any substantial way in any parts of the country. We've heard proposals with various indigenous tribes, for example, in the Northwest, like the Queets community in Northwestern Washington that are considering retreating from that particular um, Pacific coastal zone. But in terms of heat, the, the main discussions that have been happening is really around the social policy um, and around the potential interventions that could be um, effective. Right now, we have a lot of modeling data about what specific interventions might uh, ameliorate temperatures at the city block level or even at the district level, neighborhood level, yet we don't have very much empirical evidence on that right now. We're embarking on a, a project with the Urban Land Institute to actually look at, for example, buildings that are being designed and uh, developed and monitoring those in such a way to see whether there's specific things like green roofs, green walls, whether there's blue-green uh, or, or water features, whether there's specific geometries or configurations of that building that could actually ameliorate temperatures and study that empirically. So we are embarking upon that right now. There are some really off-the-shelf things like we've already heard from Dr. Guadaro and others um, about uh, green infrastructure as being a really important first step to this, um, uh, to achieving this. So um, the social policy questions are really at the core of it and whether communities are really going, uh, uh, taking a step into this will really depend on what federal government guidance is given. Uh, to I'm sorry, I want to just interrupt because I want to get one more question for Dr. Bernstein, but I, I do just want to point out that a lot of the areas that you see this are areas where because of redlining, it's concentrated. So there is a reverse redlining question at some level. Um, Dr. Bernstein, you're, you mentioned um, some of the issues around things less than death, increased workplace fatality. We had Dr. Jisung Park um, testify to the exactly this issue on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis earlier this week and how they're starting to see some evidence of um, increased you know, OSHA issues um, at rising heat. Any quick comments in the little time we've got left on areas for further research on that front? Sure. Uh, we need to very much understand, uh, much more so for rural areas than we do urban areas. Most of the data we have is in urban areas. Uh, we need to focus on uh, the ties to between the economic effects. So we see the impairments in economic productivity, the losses in GDP, and as a result of heat. Um, and those get compounded by individual effects from heat. So the same places where the economy is getting hit by heat, we see compounded effects upon individuals. But critically, again, we need to focus on understanding what we can do to mitigate heat. And, and Representative Cast and I, I also would underscore that it's hard to have this conversation and talking about all we can do to essentially adapt to heat when it's very clear that the single best thing we can do to address all of the above is to prevent greenhouse gas emissions in the first place. That'll be far more effective than hyperlocalized data. It'll be far more effective than me writing prescriptions or telling people how to stay out of heat. 
from both a I'm afraid the gentleman's standpoint time has and expired. a expired. Here, here, and I yield back. Um, thank you. And next, I'd like to recognize Mr. Chris for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank to the uh, thanks to all the witnesses for being with us today. In cities across the country, the summer of 21 is off to the hottest start on record. Dangerously high temperatures have hammered the West, worsening existing drought and wildlife conditions and leading to nearly 200 heat related deaths. In my home state of Florida, our sunshine may bring welcome warmth in the winter, uh, but it can be pretty darn hot in the summer. Just last month, as a matter of fact, the heat index in Miami reached 108 degrees prompting the National Weather Service to issue a hazardous weather outlook. And a recent study from the University of Florida found that heat-related deaths occur year-round in Florida. This national problem requires a national response. That's why I'm working with our colleague in the Senate, Senator Markey of Massachusetts, to introduce the Preventing Heat Illness and Deaths Act. This bill would formalize and expand the National Integrated Heat Health information system, as well as establish an interagency committee to oversee federal efforts to address extreme heat. Dr. Shandis, uh, could you please speak to the importance of developing an integrated federal approach to reducing the impacts of extreme heat? Sure, and I'll be uh, cautious as I took up too much time last time. Um, the, the need for coordination has never been greater in this particular realm. I have witnessed far too many times a conversation with one federal agency that then gets and then gets replicated with a different federal agency and so i'm really seeing the kind of um, the the uh, split and differences across federal agencies and the lack of conversation and uh, coordinated approach that's happening even within agencies that are down the street from each other uh, physically. And so part of what I think NIHIS can really bring to the table is connect uh, uh, the human health component, which is CDC, bring together NOAA, which is the climate science entity, uh, EPA, which really can move on policy and really support local communities in taking action. And of course, FEMA, who is there to be able to identify specific hazards and bring resources to the table. So the, the coordinated approach would really lead from a, a research research base into an understanding of what the potential implications are for heat and then leading to the policy and the investments that could really safeguard a community. So NIHIS has established its in place and um, it really is about how do we move forward. And I really applaud your and um, Senator Markey's uh, bill for moving that particular entity forward. I yield back. Thank you. That's very kind of you, doctor. Um, also, I'd like to know, how could the National Integrated Health, Heat Health rather, information system be best leveraged as a mechanism and entity for improving coordination? So in specifically, I think there are three things that can happen, or two things that can happen that come to mind. One is um, we've talked about information. We're still, um, NIHIS can hold the information from a variety of different sources. That's an essential component to this, is while it's not enough, it is important to be able to gather, synthesize, and, um, and as, as we've heard before, put the information in ways that are really accessible, understandable by local municipalities. There's all kinds of techniques and ways in which we've developed communication strategies for doing that kind of work. Excuse me. Um, and second uh, is the idea of being able to be a lot more focused on the implementation side of it. What are the strategies that are working in specific parts of the region? How can NIHIS take what we've learned from the Southwest, for example, and help the Northwest better adapt to heat? How can we find ways of what's working in the Southeast in your part of the country and help uh, the Mid-Atlantic better prepare for uh, heat. And so these are uh, both the information as well as the implementation dimensions, I think, central to what NIHIS is going to be able to bring to the table. Thank you very much. And then finally, Dr. Bernstein, what kind of steps would you like to see the federal government take to address the rising health risk of extreme heat? Thank you for that question. Uh, I would love to see the federal government utilize the healthcare dollars we're spending to incentivize healthcare systems to do more to keep people safe. Through Medicare, for instance, there are now incentives to provide high quality care for various conditions, which are largely targeted at preventing readmissions. We know that heat is a major driver of hospitalization, emergency use, uh, but yet we don't incentivize providers to act. 
So we could use this massive investment of taxpayer dollars in the healthcare system, which is often used for preventable problems like heat, to get the healthcare system engaged on this problem. My big concern with our current response right now, which involves heat alerts and cooling centers, is whether they actually protect the most vulnerable. And the healthcare system, while not perfect in getting to the most vulnerable, between federally health, uh, federally qualified health centers, Medicare and Medicaid recipients, their avenues to get to the folks who are most likely to be harmed, who may be least likely to get heat alerts or information from uh, other data sources. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Before we bring the hearing to a close, I want to thank our witnesses for testifying before the committee today. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. The witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned.